right. Welcome to Meet the Candidates. I'm your host, Paul Herring. We're going to uh, round out this year's mayoral candidates uh, for the primary. We'll give you an opportunity to see each of the candidates and hear what they have to say. This evening, or actually, my first candidate is Wantois. Did I get it right? Mm -hmm. Wantois Davis. He's our uh, fifth ward city councilman, mm -hmm. and he's thrown his hat into the race. Welcome, Wantois. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Herring. There you thank go. You. That'll work. That'll work. Thank you <laughs> okay, we don't have to be too formal here. We're okay. going to be relaxed. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, and the first question I have to ask you is, is why are you running for mayor? Well, I'm running for mayor because I feel at this particular time that this city continues to take one step forward and two steps back. Uh, I think this city needs new, fresh perspective, and I think that in order to move us forward, we have to be on our own two legs, the person that gets in this office. And I am one who, are, who will be on my own two legs, and I re I'm ready to move the city forward. Uh, I'm just tired of making requests as a city councilman. I'm, I think it's time for me to start making some demands. And, and, and the only how that I can make a difference, I have to start making some demands that's beneficial to the residents of this city. Okay. What, uh, I guess, what sets you apart from the, the current mayor? What makes you different? Well, what makes me different is, is I have a vision. I have a vision and I have a plan that stems from me being on my own two legs. And I look at people on the north end and on the east side, some on the south and the west. And I just don't base all of my decisions predicated upon over there by my college and downtown. There are people that are suffering in dire need on the north end of Flint and the east side of Flint, south and west. And what I think that I can do, I can adhere to those needs. They've been neglected for so long. And since this mayor has been in office, he hasn't spoken about anything in regards to moving these people forward and bringing some of their needs to the forefront. And, and that's what I feel that I am totally different from him. I got a vision. I got a plan. I'm ready to come up with an economic and development plan that benefits everybody in Flint that are living in the uh, impoverished times. You know, that's living in poverty. We got 80 to 88 percent of people that's living in this city that's living in poverty. You got over a third in this city, which is over 30,000 in a small populated city that has felonies on their record and they cannot get a job. These two critical issues must be addressed and I'm ready to address these issues. I know what they need and I know what's going to take them out of the realm or the situation that makes them irritated and frustrated that's predicated upon irrational feelings. And I know what they need to get that back to a positive direction. And that's why I think I'm better than the mayor. I have an understanding of what's really going on in our community because I talk to them every day, and, and, and they explain to me what their frustrations are with no restraints. All right, well, you know, everybody's, uh, not everybody, but there's a, a large number of people in Flint that are up in arms about water. Mm -hmm. And uh, I understand it's a hot issue. Yes, hot it topic. is. Yes, it is. What's the plan? Well, my plan is, first, you have to develop an economic and development plan. Flint is an industrialized city. Mm -hmm. It's always been an industrialized city. There's no jobs, though. Auto industry is gone, but manufacturing is thriving and it's booming everywhere besides Flint. You got manufacturing in Oxford, Fenton, Clarkston, Howe, Brighton, Arvin Hill, Bay City, Saginaw. We got Buick site. You got AC spark plug site. We can bring some manufacturing there. Let's put some jobs there. When we start generating jobs, people start getting paychecks. Income taxes start going up. And they don't have to steal water out the steal money out the water sewer fund. We generate seventy million dollars a year out the water and sewer fund. Why is that? Income taxes don't come in because I just explained about the eighty-eight percent, and I also explained about the people with the felonies on their record. So what they do, they stick their hand in that seventy million dollars, and they misappropriate money out of that money, which is earmarked. It's supposed to only be spent for water and sewer purposes. But they stick their hand in that money and they start paying for other services that income and property taxes would normally pay for. And in return, the way that they erase from what they've taken out of it, which is called the cash pool, which is criminal, they raise people rates up. So when people see that their water rates is 80 and $90 more than what it should be, that's them really paying for other services that the water and sewer fund shouldn't be paying for. So when you bring jobs in, you get people off the street, you get people to working, people are getting income taxes, they're able to buy property and they're getting property taxes, then they don't have to misappropriate and take money out the water and sewer fund, which to me is criminal. And that's how you resolve that. Crime comes down, small businesses goes up, income taxes goes up, 
we'd be right back on the same course we was when General Motors was really thriving and booming. Because there is nowhere in this country where they have manufacturing and they're suffering economically. And so that would help the water rates to go down because they don't have to misappropriate the water and sewer fund and put the burden on the backs of the residents when I bring manufacturing jobs here. That's how we resolve it. Now, if you say it's illegal, why wouldn't you just stop the practice? Well, it's kind of difficult to stop the practice because when you got people that's in office, we just got a CFO here. One thing about accountants, the accountants know how to erase it and make it look as if nothing has ever occurred. But it has to take a person who's dealing with common sense and know exactly what's going on, especially when you look at the budget and you look at the finances, to know that they're actually stealing money out of what you would call the cash pool. For one, the water and sewer fund should never be called a cash pool. Cash pool is an illegal term. The water and sewer fund is supposed to be spent specifically on water and sewer purposes, capital improvement, maintenance, legacy costs, you know, keeping some money in the bank for reserve. That's what that money's supposed to be used. And also paying paychecks for people that's working in the water and sewer department. But they put that money in the cash pool, which is a hat. Everybody come throw money in a hat, and you can reach your hand in it and be able to use it for whatever you want to use it for. And that's what they do. This is the reason why we was held in a deficit. Because a lot of money was taken outside of the cash pool, and it was never no accountability. And it was always hid. And it was finally discovered when the Treasury Department in Lansing did an audit on this city and found out we was eight million dollars in debt and they gave the mayor the opportunity to erase that debt or deal with that debt and he submitted a 10 point deficit eliminate elimination plan they approved it and they gave him the opportunity to move it forward and he never did anything about it the third time they contacted him and telling him to pick up the pace he still ignored them so eventually they sent the letter saying due to the fact that you defaulted on your proposition to us we are now considering your city to be held under state of emergency. And most of that debt was out the water and sewer department. Can I just talk about public safety? Yes. Is it getting better or worse in Flint? It's and getting worse. It's getting worse. It it's getting worse. Whenever you're living in an impoverished time, which is poverty, lack, most people in this city are lacking jobs. You got over 30,000 men and women with felonies on their record and they can't get a job. They have the propensities, the propensity and the tendencies to go back and Back to crime. Who is best to do crime but the ones who's already done it before? But they don't want to go back to crime. So they sit on their porch or they sit in their house. They can't pay a $25 metro telephone bill. They get angry. They get frustrated. They become irritated. And all, all three of that was produced is irrational thinking. So they go out and commit crime. We become recidivists. It tax our city. It tax our city to the point where that it becomes a detriment to the community. But when there was jobs in the 70s and the 80s, you didn't see crime the way it is now. So people say, Councilman, what is the difference between the 70s, 80s, and now? There was opportunity. There was jobs that was afforded to everybody. You got people walking around that can't get a job. There is no jobs here for them. And if they ever get a job, it's only through a temp agency that would only hire them for 89 days. And they got to spend half of their paycheck to drive to Howe, Clarkston, Oxford, Arbon Hill, Brighton just to work in those manufacturers. And then they work for 89 days and they lay them off. Then they back at point A. So survival instincts kicks in. And so what they do, they resort back to the streets. That's the only recourse that they have. But how do we resolve that? By bringing opportunity and jobs. See, it's nothing about creating the wheel. It's about reinventing the wheel. See, the old principles back in the day when I was a child, it worked. It worked real good. We had summer programs. We had after-school programs. We had summer, summer jobs. And everybody was working. If you wanted to work, you had the ability to work. There was jobs that was going to hire you. Well, what happened when all that left? Crime escalated. So what should we do to bring it back to the way that it once was? Bring opportunity and jobs back. They send men home from Michigan Department of Correction because the federal funds, the state funds in Lansing, has $9 billion. Do you know that they spend over $2 billion for the Michigan Department of Correction? And the governor is sending them home like leaves falling off the tree. But when you send them home, there's no opportunity for them out here. There's no recourse. There's no system in place that can get these men on the right course. So they resort back to the streets. And it's just not about people with felonies on their record. It's about people that just live in impoverished times who's looking for opportunity. But there's none here. This is what this mayor's supposed to be doing. 
finding out ways to give opportunity to the residents who has lost opportunity, who has become hopeless. The governor brings jobs to the state. The mayor's supposed to bring jobs to the city. And that's what I want to do. But I want to bring jobs that's going to be afforded to everyone. And that's how we get rid of the crime. We've got less than two minutes left. And maybe in your closing and your plea for uh, support, mm -hmm. you could talk about blight briefly. Well, blight, the way that I would deal with blight, we have what you would call CDBG money, community block grant money in the city. I would use some of that money for summer jobs. You can get these kids from the age 15 to 17 and clean up these areas with all this dump. You can get kids to go and board up houses. See, we have to mold them into having good work ethics. And there's a lot of blight around that can be cleaned up. And it can be cleaned up in a productive manner where people will be able to get paychecks. We give money for community and development. But let's make it to give summer jobs to the kids to go out there and do the, clean up all the blight. All right, you got 60 seconds. Go ahead, look in the camera and, and convince uh, people to vote for you. Please vote for me because one thing about me is I'm transparent. I stand on my own two legs. And every decision that I would make when I become mayor will be predicated upon what God tells me that I should do that's beneficial to the residents of this city. I want to bring strength back to this city, and I want to bring residents back to invest in trust back into local government. And that's what I would do when I become your mayor, because I would change the dynamics, I would change the status quo, and I would try to bring opportunity and hope to those who have become hopeless. Thank you very much, City Councilman, Vice President, City Councilman. Juan Tuez Davis, please elect me for mayor August the 4th. Thank you, and may you please have a God blessed day. Thank you very much. All right, All right guys, you're watching Meet the Candidates with your host, Paul Herring. There'll be more after this.